I see this as a kickoff meeting for maybe many more meetings. So I want to start off by giving me a really good ground zero and off you what I've learned over the past decades. Not everything, but a few things I've learned with Dave Snowden and other Kinevin practitioners. Ground zero begins with a map. And there is one of the complexity of sciences. This is really easy to find. You just have to Google complexity map. And you'll bring up the map that um, Brian Castellano started off and he's updated this map. This is the 2021 version. The authors have defined five interesting horizontal streams. Again, I won't go into the details of it, but if you read anything about complexity, I find this map, particularly for myself, is very useful to see the similarities and differences. There's no right or wrong. There's just a different way of looking at complexity. The red box is where we play. This is what the authors have deemed the applied complexity bubble. This is where they have placed Dave Snowden's work in the human aspects of complex adaptive systems. Dave describes sense making as how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it. Today, I'll mainly talk about the anthro complexity approach in red. And there's two parts to that, complex adaptive systems and this other term called distributed ethnography. Then I'll briefly touch on a process we use called naturalizing sense making, which means we use natural science as a constraint to make meaning of uncertainty. At one level of the natural world, it appears to be uncertain, unpredictable, ambiguous, volatile. We call this a complex system. Extreme weather storms are good examples, hurricanes, tornadoes, Fortunately, these extreme events eventually dissipate all of their energy and they do die out. When living things are involved, we call it a complex adaptive system. That's because living things will avoid dying and adapt to survive. We also observe that there are underlying patterns of order in the natural world. Some are hidden, waiting to be discovered by humans. Example is apples were falling off trees long before Newton came along and created the natural law of gravity. We know that the sizing of animals follows some sense of order. A mouse will never be as large as an elephant. Human males average about 1.8 meters in height and females 1.6. Of course, the more fascinating patterns of order are fish swarming and birds flocking. Now, humans are different than other living organisms. We possess what we call the three eyes, intelligence, intent, and identity. We really like this idea of order and what it offers. Certainty, stability, predictability, consistency, repeatability. And over time, we've learned how to use our intelligent brains to create order. An example, we organize a hierarchy based on size. Even though whales are much larger than humans, we have something called ego. And so we put us at the top of the food chain. It's also very clear whoever made this chart is a real male chauvinist. Why a man on top and why is the woman under there? Right? So, so using our intelligence, we can impose constraints to create an order system. So constrained that if then cause and effect relationships can be generated. In safety, these constraints are typically regulations, standards, policies, subsystems, org structures, processes, procedures, rules. Intent means within this ordered system, we as humans are able to articulate a purpose, vision, mission, and we can imagine a future state of being. An identity says as individuals, we each can play different roles. We can be a work role, a family role, a community role. So we are one living organism with the capability to behave differently depending on the role that we are in. 
Now there's a third natural system called chaotic. Everything is totally random, no rhyme, no reason, no logic. It's a system we enter when unexpected failure occurs, like an accident, a machine breakdown, a building collapsing, or worst of all, a human fatality. It's also a temporary state. You don't stay in it for long. You act quickly to get out of chaos. And if you don't act quickly, you hesitate, somebody else will. On the other hand, falling into chaos can reveal positive opportunities. We have a word for that, serendipity. We can also generally fall into chaos, contain the initial negative consequences and manage the outcomes. We also have a phrase for that. We call it disruptive innovation. In safety, the intent is to avoid chaos. So we have used our intelligence to create different approaches like safety one, two, three, hop, new view. The safety differently view I have been exploring for several years is that safety is an emergent property of a complex adaptive system. You don't see safety as a product or a service or something that you create. It just emerges from the conditions, the constraints that you have placed into the organization. When a violent storm unexpectedly appears, we adapt to survive. We change the human imposed constraints, hoping that safety emerges. But we also must be very alert because our adjustments may enable danger to emerge. This graphic shows the three systems as a single plane. A complex adaptive system contains all three systems. This is the concept of systems of systems or nested systems. You don't remain in one system, but will move from one system to another to get work done. The boundary between order and chaos represents a physical cliff you can actually fall over. So just think of taking a piece of paper and folding over to create an edge that you can fall over. If you've heard of the term edge of chaos, it is represented by this boundary. The red arc moving between complex and order or from chaos to complex is a transitional mental shift, not an abrupt physical change. All industries like aviation and aerospace are complex adaptive systems. And all organizations within an industry are complex adaptive systems. So with this basic understanding of the three systems, let's see how we can develop a framework to make sense of the real world. And the reason why we want that is that we want to make better decisions. So what we'll do is that we'll start by splitting order into two domains, complicated and clear. We'll put one in the middle and we'll call it confused. This is the state of not knowing where you are. This is the Kinevin framework. It's a sense-making framework. It's not a prescriptive solution, but just a way to describe where you are at this moment. We make sense of the present situation so we can act accordingly and make the appropriate decision. So we'll talk a bit about that. This is how the Kinevin framework is drawn. Kinevin allows you to understand how to act. Each domain has its own decision-making methods and tools. And no domain is better than any other. A clear domain has rigid constraints such as golden safety rules, best practices, SOPs. Decision-making is very clear. What we do is that we sense, we categorize, and we respond. You've seen this situation before, and you're trained to get it done. There's only one right answer, so comply and just do it. Experts in the complicated domain develop rigid constraints by using their decision-making method, sense, analyze, respond. Experts also develop governing constraints to manage the business and op an organization. If these experts can't agree on a problem fix 
or maybe want a new solution, they move into the complex domain to probe sense and response. This means conducting trial and error experiments, discover a new idea that may emerge as a solution they can bring back into the complicated domain. If we fall into the chaotic domain, the decision-making process is getting the hell out of there quickly as possible. So what we do is that we act, sense, and response. And in the middle is confused. This covers those situations where you don't know what to do. You could choose to deliberately stay there, wait, and observe how things unfold, or choose to head to another domain and follow its decision-making method. You'll hear people say that they feel that they're in constant chaos. Well, if they're not in any physical danger, I would suggest they're probably in the confused domain and just not sure what to do. In some cases, it's this idea of being stuck or being paralyzed. You just don't know what to do. So let's create a Kinevin framework for aviation safety. I find the beauty of Kinevin over the years is that there are seven versions available. I'm gonna pick the one that's gonna be used for us. It's a very straightforward one. And in the middle is just something called confused. Other versions have apparatic confused for a deeper conversation. While the latest version adds something called liminal spaces. Now liminal spaces is just a concept that came from anthropology. It's a suspended state before you switch into different domains. And the longer you can hold it here in this temporary suspended state, the less risky it is when you finally move over there. We don't really need to know that for our conversation today, but it's nice to know that if we do, we can introduce that. During the Belfa conference in May, I showed in which Canaveral domain the earlier February conference presenters resided. In the clear domain training, is a huge component. Frontline workers adhere to SOPs and sense categories response to get work done. This is the old Nike, just do it, right here. When a presenter came up talking about complicated mechanical system, well, that's easy. That's right in the Kinevin complicated me. Aviation regulators, they work here as well. They do develop governing constraints, such as these regs and these standards to guide worker behavior in the industry. And then management and safety professionals translate these constraints into policies and plans and rules and procedures to direct clear domain workers. If you're in risk management, this is where risk management is performed because it's done by expert analysts in the complicated domain. This is interesting. I am showing the social technical system straddling the complicated complex border. On that single plane diagram, it's that red line. This is not a physical shift. It's a mental shift between here back and forth. Okay. And why is it here? Because people must deal with known knowns and known unknowns, better known as risk, in the complicated as well as unknown unknowns in the complex domain. And depending on the information you're seeking, knowledge you want, you may be here, go there, and you may come back here. So this is often we call a loop back and forth. That's where the complex social technical system fits really well. Way over here in the complex, and this is what Robert DeBoer presented, innovative micro experiments. This is where Robert knows very well in his book, what he does in the complex domain. He's experimenting. He doesn't know what the outcomes are going to be. They're quite unpredictable. And he just wanted to see what will emerge as a potential solution that could be quite useful. If you have learning crews and learning reviews, they belong here. And one of the presenters did that and it nicely fit in with their, what they call sense-making steps. Let's put this all together now by asking, how much time is spent in each Kinevin domain? Now, here's a really important point. 
It's imperative that you understand the context when using Kinevin. The context here is operations, pilots in the cockpit of a commercial airliner supported by operational staff. This will be different if you're flying a bush plane to some remote territory. And if you're not in operations, but let's say involved in safety system design or accident investigation, you'll find that the majority of your time will be in the complicated domain and maybe stretch into that complex domain to better understand what happened. Now, these are ballpark estimates that um, James and I looked upon. We figured, okay, 95% of the time, commercial pilots are in their order system to clear and, and complicated domains. As a passenger, I'm really happy about this because I want a smooth flight in full compliance with safety rules. Pilots spend about 3% of the time navigating away from the boundary between the clear and the chaotic domains. As you recall, if you're here as an operating point and you plunge over, you're going to have some sort of a failure. What they want to do is recognize that when they're getting close, and I, I denote that with this coral oval region, they recognize patterns and apply intuition and task knowledge. This is Stephen Schrock's diagram, which he presented. And you can see he also understands where patterns fit in his particular model. Besides natural science, we also apply what we have learned from cognitive science. We know that the human brain was not designed to read and write documents, but you recognize patterns. That's why patterns are so powerful. So let's put ourselves in a pilot seat. The plane is typically in the air and confronting uncontrollable weather conditions that you sense may enable danger to emerge. From your monitoring, you anticipate turbulence. So you turn on the seatbelt warning indicators and maybe even tell us over the PA system that we may be encountering some bumpiness. So in total between these, 90% of the time, it's still in the ordered system. So where's the remaining 2%? If a failure occurs while in the air, you fall in the chaotic domain. This isn't a disaster like a crash, but an unexpected surprise, like maybe smoke appearing, maybe there's a fire, or maybe a passenger suddenly behaving badly. So the first response is stabilizing the situation and moving into the confused domain. If you're a pilot and you're flying and some alarm goes off, you're probably saying, well, have I seen this before? If I haven't, who do I need to talk to who has? If that resource isn't available, then you have to move into the complex domain and start experimenting using hunches based on your past experience. An aerospace example we can use is the Apollo 13 crisis. They had to create a carbon monoxide scrubber only using what was available in the capsule. And it's amazing what can emerge when you have limited resources and under tremendous time pressure. Now, if you heard of the term weak signal detection, this is where it happens. This is the whole idea of like, okay, something I don't feel good about. What can we do get away from the boundary, not fall over into the chaotic domain. Work in the clear and complicated domain, I believe falls under this term safety one that Eric Hallingo coined, and also what we call robustness. Safety two is understanding why things go well. This is what we do in the complex domain. We probe with experiments, monitor the consequences, learn what works or doesn't work, and respond with new solutions to make a system more resilient. Dave Soda also describes resilience as this early detection I just spoke about. This is safety too as well, making performance adjustments to back away from the cliff. When you look at the entire Kedevin framework, you can see why we say 
safety one and safety two is a both and and not an either or. Um, I'm honestly quite tired of hearing the button tossing going between the safety one and the safety two people. It's not a dichotomy, it's a both and. That's the complexity component of anthro complexity. So let me give you a brief chat about the anthro part, which is distributed ethnography, and then moving into this thing called SenseMaker. Okay. This is the SenseMaker process developed by Dave Snowden. Dave started developing this way back in 2004, and it's gone through some iterations. This is the latest slide that, well, not latest, but it's a slide that I use. You can see it's dated 2012. So it's really improving over the test of time. The first phase is the design phase where we create a survey or collector. Then we go into a narrative collection and we do it online from anyone, anywhere, 24 7, 365. This is what we call distributed ethnography. Essentially, we're saying that everybody is an ethnographer and they have stories that they can listen to and there are stories that they can share. So we are stealing from the science of anthropology. In the analysis and sense-making step, we can look at patterns that are formed by the narratives in, on a real-time dashboard. SenseMaker is a pattern detection software tool and an underlying methodology that adheres to the basic principles of working in a complex adaptive system. Now, Stories are a huge component of culture. Behaviors are above the waterline because we can see them. Stories are below the waterline, way down deep in what we call the iceberg model. Stories provide context in terms of deep feelings and emotions. Early detection means capturing I've got a bad feeling about this stories before they turn into, if I only had known, or I wish they had said something about it stories. And stories can be about compliance and stories can be about caring. It's whatever storytellers are willing to share. We're all quite aware that the industry focuses on lagging indicators for measurement. Well, attitudes are leading indicators. We're getting insights of how people are feeling, but have not acted yet. And we can capture them in the form of these everyday stories, narratives that people are telling each other. But the big question is, do management and all those at the blunt end of the safety sphere, are they hearing them? Well, firstly, it depends on the level of psychological safety organization do people in the blunt sphere end really want to hear these stories? And even if they hear them, do they do anything about them? And secondly, it depends on how easy is it for people to share their narratives. And this is how we engage the human aspects of a complex adaptive system. So this past summer, we launched a Belpa Cranfield cognitive study deploying SenseMaker software. And as of today, I, there's well over 100 stories. And I'll leave it to Jenkins to show you what the dashboard even looks like. What I'm really interested in is this question about heuristics. I think we should ask the question to find out what are these heuristics pilots are using We're in that coral oval space to pull back from the edge and into the safe operating end. I believe highly experienced pilots have a ton of mental shortcuts or rules of thumbs that are being passed down. This is the concept of the master apprentice craft model of learning. The little diagram showing expert here, that's Ivan Popoditi's presentation on experts. I'm excited to see that we are capturing undocumented task knowledge from pirates. And I think one of the real cool things we can do is turn them into explicit knowledge 
share them in the aviation aerospace community, and hopefully we can start pulling back from the edge of chaos as we know it.